By 1944, the juggernaut of Soviet military prowess had come a long way from the dark days of 1941. Smaller successes like Operation Little Saturn gave the Soviet High Command a glimpse of what was to come and more importantly, much needed experience. However, before the success of the summer of 1944, the Red Army was still plagued by overambitious offensives that ended in utter defeat. For example, as soon as the December counteroffensive of 1941 succeeded in pushing the Wehrmacht back from Moscow, Stalin ordered for a second offensive to begin on January the 7th, 1942. The broad stroke style offensive proved too much for the ill-prepared Soviet army, which suffered various encirclements in what was to become the Ryzhev salient. Fast forward to the 23rd of November, 1942, and the Soviets had just completed their encirclement of the German 6th Army at Stalingrad. A subsequent operation named Little Saturn was conducted just two weeks later, which pushed German relief forces from the vicinity of Stalingrad. But here too, the Soviets became overly ambitious, wanting to target multiple army groups, thus culminating in the disastrous defeat at Kharkiv and the formation of the Kursk salient. However, the failure of the latter operation would especially haunt Konstantin Rokossovsky, the gifted commander of the Soviet Central Front, who had earlier proved himself by executing one of the first successful defensive actions of the war on June the 28th, 1941. Of course, we all know about the Battle of Kursk and how the initiative of the Eastern Front shifted to the Soviets. But the real precursor to the success of 1944 came in December, 1943. This marked the start of what is known as the third and final period of the war. Soviet forces quickly pushed through the steppes of Ukraine, encircling a German salient along the Dnieper, known as the Cherkessy Pocket. Concurrent to this, the siege of Leningrad had finally been lifted after a grueling 900 days. In particular, the Iranian bomb salient, which had never fallen to the Germans, was reinforced by sea thus allowing for a breakout. The Germans subsequently fell back to the Baltic. In the south, the Soviets attempted to use the Carpathian Mountains to cut the Germans in two. Thus they attempted to replicate their previous success in the Dnieper by encircling the 1st Panzer Army, but this failed with a successful breakout in which 200,000 German soldiers escaped. Even then, in the further south, the 6th Army was also able to evade encirclement, but only just. Things were going very wrong for Germany. Partisan activity throughout Europe had significantly increased, with the Germans even occupying Hungary to prevent its defection. Allied strategic bombing had also tied down the German Luftwaffe, causing a disparity in air power for the subsequent summer offensive. The Romanians even used back channels to negotiate peace with the Soviets, but hell was coming. By May, Sevastopol had fallen. A far cry from the tenacious defense of the city employed by the Soviets in the early war. The only area that seemed safeguarded was Belarusia, which was able to deflect limited Soviet attacks during the first half of 1944. The front line protruded outward in what would become known as the Belarusian Balcony. The Soviets had obviously improved in their avoidance of broad offensives, however the chaotic nature of early 1944 still beset them with challenges. The main issue was that for much of the war, the Soviets didn't even properly employ their military doctrine of deep battle. Deep Battle Doctrine was essentially the brainchild of three military theoreticians. Russian Civil War Commander Mikhail Tukhachevsky, Vladimir Kiryakovich Triandafilov, and Brigade Commander Georgi Samoilovich Isersen. For Tukhachevsky, Deep Battle developed in light of the rapid strategic redeployments of the Russian Civil War. In its most basic sense, 
deep battle emphasized four key tenets that would become very important in the 1944 summer offensive. They were to keep the initiative, to employ Maskirovka, to concentrate forces, to initiate exploitation to operational depths after tactical penetrations. So what does this all mean? Well, in a sense, command structures were meant to be decentralized in order to ensure that local commanders had the flexibility to maneuver in different scenarios. Such flexibility would allow commanders to react more quickly to different threats allowing fluid operations. This was the initiative. In addition, maskirovka or deception was employed in order to trick the Germans regarding the strategic redeployments of Soviet rear units. Historians like Jonathan House talk about this with a lot of strange examples. Dummy tanks, fake radio conversations, lots of noise. So I'm going to just skip to the next tenant, concentration of forces. If you're like me and you spend your time reading Soviet general staff reports on the various battles of the Second World War, you can't help but notice the obsession with graphs comparing troop strengths. This is called the correlation of forces, which was Marxian in its scientific approach to war. This approach wasn't even exclusive to the military, as Stalin even used the same line of thinking. For example, in reference to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, Professor Richard Tempest even stated that uh, The thing is that uh, he uh, evaluated uh, what the Marxists call the correlation of forces via um, a, a uh, Marxist-Leninist uh, uh, understanding of what makes history move forward or what makes uh, uh, politics tick. The idea behind the correlation of forces was to ensure decisive numerical superiority, not on the broad front, but in a specific area. Isserson went on to elaborate. No offensive mission can be accomplished without clear and decisive superiority on the axis of the main front. Any speculation about distributed fronts, reduced densities, and the possibility of combined blows along various axes contradicts the conditions of modern combat. Hence, the first three tenets of deep battle cover the sort of general prerequisites to an assault, but how would said assault come to fruition? The fourth tenet explains this well. To initiate exploitation to operational depths after tactical penetrations. So what does that mean? In layman terms, an exploitation is when an army takes advantage of a gap in a front line and pushes through. However, here's the catch. Operational depths. This is a fancy way of saying that the army should not just focus on encircling frontline enemy units, but should focus on penetrating the enemy's rear as to disrupt their industry, lines of communications, and so on. The excerpt, after tactical penetration, simply meant that forward units known as shock armies would first rip a small hole in the front line, in which second echelon tank armies and cavalry mechanized corps would plow through unabated. According to Triandafilov, a shock army would include four to five rifle corps with their organic artillery assets, four to five artillery divisions, and 8 to 12 tank battalions. The key was timing, as early exploitations wore down mechanized units significantly, thus halting the exploitation, whereas late exploitations could give the enemy time to plug the gap. This all absolutely flew in the face of contemporary German doctrine, which was more acquainted with the tactical realm of encirclement via concepts like Bewegenskrieg. We can even see this logic with Hitler's prioritization in destroying the bulk of the Red Army through encirclement in the western borderlands. This was opted 
rather than the capture of Moscow during the planning phase of Operation Barbarossa. So I'm not trying to say German doctrine was bad, but yeah, it was bad. This is because Bewegenskrieg would essentially have tanks focus on a single decisive point, or Schwerpunkt, in order to form a breakthrough for the mechanized infantry to rush through. There seemed an emphasis on finding an enemy's vulnerabilities rather than in creating them. German theorists essentially relied on maneuver for exploitations, whereas the Soviets created exploitations through careful wear and tear. German doctrine seemed more appropriate to the 19th century given the limited size of armies and the ample opportunity for envelopment, which would be dictated by speed. However, Soviet doctrine took into account the advent of the operational level of command and how extended front lines would present more difficulty in maneuver-based exploitation. Furthermore, Soviet deep battle doctrine emphasized on the double envelopment, and not just the focus on one decisive point. This divergence in thinking is further confirmed by the fact that the main Soviet forces in Operation Bagration actually attacked the most fortified areas, thus disregarding the essence of Bewegen's Creed, to attack a vulnerable point. Hello everyone, Blitz of the Reich here. I hope you all enjoyed this video and learned something new about what I think to be the most decisive operation in the entirety of the Second World War. What I have here is a poster that I have made from scratch I have digitally painted all the geographic and political features of the Operation Bagration period. Now, if you would like to help fundraise for this channel, and if you would like to help uh, continue this documentary, please consider buying one of these posters. They are available in Teespring. I will put the link in the description. Uh, I have also offered a promotion code because I want people to get this map. I don't want to make it expensive for you all. So I've put a promotion code. It is Spicy Blitz, and I've put it in the pinned comments in the description. So please check it out. Um, as you can see, I have order battle, uh, movements, operational directions, staff co representatives. The only amendment I would say is that Army Group C is not part of OB West in the current map because this was actually an error I made. It was, our Army Group C was actually part directly subordinate to Oberkommando de Wehrmacht, so I've removed that part, but everything else stays the same. In the smaller map, the dimensions are just different, but still. Also, please consider being a patron if, uh, if you'd like, but if not, thank you for enjoying this video. I humbly and really appreciate that you watched this far. And I would also like to reiterate my thanks and gratitude to, uh, for the battle footage of uh, the Battle of Vitebsk, um, thank you. I would like to give thanks to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for that. So thank you again for watching, and I hope to see you guys in part two.